This is an SBC Media Partners production. Swung on, hit high and deep. Right field. Right field. Right field. Right field. It is Phillies fans, these are your glove stories with Murph. Let's check in with Greg Murphy. Murphy, got a special guest, huh? Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Glove Stories with Murph, brought to you by the great folks at the Parks Casino Sportsbook app and Red Robin. And our guest today, well, uh, he certainly needs no introduction. A 10-year major league career, uh, followed by a long career in the public eye and broadcasting. He's an author. He's done just about everything that uh, you can imagine after baseball. Uh, He finished his career with a 300 career batting average, 100 home runs, on the nose, but only what 592 RBIs. John Kruk, he couldn't get another eight to make it uh, to make it 600 even. Well, if I'd have known, I might have stayed longer, but <laughs> I had no clue. John Kruk joining us today. Uh, good to see you, John. Thank you for doing this. And uh, let's uh, let's go back to the beginnings because we're lucky enough that uh, we sit in the office and we get to hear the stories of the early days of John Crock, your, your early days in West Virginia, growing up with with your brothers and uh, and out there all day, every day, competing in just about everything you guys could think of, right? Uh, that's pretty much the way it was growing up for you guys? Yeah, whatever season, uh, whatever season it was, that's what we played, you know? Yeah. Uh, but uh, baseball is not a first love. Uh, it was different for me because... Uh, you know, I, I just enjoyed basketball so much more because there was more action and, you know, you're always having – and I was a point guard, so I always had to try to outthink my opponent. So I, I think deep down that helped me greatly in baseball, having to, uh, you know, know players' tendencies and, and different things like that. It helped me uh, understand how pitchers were trying to work me as I got older. Uh, but, yeah, I, I best, baseball was just really, really boring to me. <laughs> well, when did you realize that perhaps baseball, uh, albeit boring for you, might be the uh, the path for you? When did basketball start to to kind of wane and you realize that, all right, if I'm going to make it as a professional athlete, I'm going to be a ball player? Yeah, 5'10", uh, <laughs> NBA was not in my, uh, in, in, not even in my thoughts. But uh, I went to a junior college and uh, the right fielder on a baseball team, Jim Chabaney, Hurt his, uh, uh, hurt his knee playing football that fall. So the baseball coach was asking me if I wanted to come out, play, you know, come play, come play. We need a right fielder. But I've never played the outfield in my life. Uh, and I, at first I told him no for a long time. And, and, uh, and then he said uh, magic words that got me to, to uh, want to play baseball. And that was, we go for two weeks to Florida for spring break. <laughs> and I'm like, you got yourself a right fielder, my friend. <laughs> and, so, and that's how it started. And then, you know, I started noticing as we were playing uh, in the spring that there was like these guys back there and they got stopwatches and clipboards and, uh, you know, radar guns and all that junk. And uh, so I asked one of the guys on the team, I said, what, who are these older guys back here with all these damn stopwatches and, and uh, stuff like that. And they said, oh, that one guy's a scout for the Reds. One's a scout for the Yankees. One's a scout for the Dodgers. What? And I'm like, scout for what? And I got, cause I, I was really clueless as to the whole process. And, uh, and, and, and I had a really good year and I got drafted. And uh, at first I got drafted by the pirates in a January draft that didn't go well. <laughs> uh, the guy, uh, came to meet with me and my dad to try right. to sign me. And he basically told me, we're going to send you to Bradenton, Florida, and then we're going to send you home. And I'm like, wow, what a sales pitch that was. And, and my dad was very colorful and he told him what he could do to himself. <laughs> and uh, he just walked out of the room. And so, you know, he asked me, he said, well, what do you think? I said, you heard him. And I repeated what my dad said. And uh, so we drove home. And we were probably like, didn't say a word, probably a 30 minute drive or so. We didn't say a word to each other. And probably about five minutes before we got home, I said, so what happens if I don't get drafted again? He goes, well, I guess that's on you now. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> you, know, you talk about pressure for a 19 year old yeah. kid. You know? But you know, Hey, it worked. So where did you play in between uh, the getting drafted the first time and then going and getting drafted by the Padres in the third round? Well, I went, uh, 
I went to a summer league uh, in, in Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley League, and played for the New Market Rebels. And uh, I was doing really well. And uh, I, I believe I was the only junior college kid in the league. Uh, it's probably a step, it's a step below the Cape Cod League uh, as far as, you know, where your top college prospects probably go to the Cape Cod and then right. the Shenandoah Valley is probably, you know, second. And, uh, and um, you know, I got the coach called me and this other guy in the room and said, hey, you, both, you guys got drafted. And, you know, you got drafted. They told the other guy, you got drafted by the Reds. And he said, you got drafted by the Padres. And I'm like, wow, Padres, where in the hell is that? And who are they? <laughs> I, I really had no clue who they were. Because right, because you weren't a big baseball fan growing up, right? No, and we didn't have we didn't have cable. And and when we did get cable, when I was like in the probably 11th grade, it was all WGN, watch the Cubs, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, TBS, we yes, watched, yeah. the, uh, watched the Braves. So I, I was more of a Braves fan than anything uh, growing up uh, you know, or at that time. Because I just like the Braves. I don't know. I, I never. I don't know why I didn't like the Cubs, but neither team was very good at those at those times. So right. it really wasn't. A, you know, it, I couldn't have made a bad decision on picking a winner or a loser because neither <laughs> one of them were very good. And so I, you know, the guy told me, he said, you know, you're better off going to a four year school, and uh, you know, you, you know, you're not going to make it. Yeah, it was just like it was all these negative things. I'm like, you know what? Uh, I didn't participate well in school. No, you know, yeah, I know it shocks you. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I decided to sign. And uh, I think I got, uh, I think my signing bonus was like 500 bucks. Unbelievable. And, uh, you know, I thought at that time, I mean, we, you know, we didn't grow up with a whole lot, but $500 in my pocket. I'm like, shoot, this ain't bad. Yeah. And, that's uh, money out to San Diego, maybe. Well, I had to go to Walla Walla, Washington first <laughs> and never been on a plane in my life. And it had to like, Oh my God. I think it was like, I think I had to get on like four or five flights just to get there. It was crazy. I mean, I, I was clueless about airports. I'd never been in one. And uh, man, it was, it was, uh, it was not a whole scary. lot of change, John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, they, that my, that's what my friends back in West Virginia say. You know, the great thing about you is you haven't changed. I said, exactly. well, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm smart <laughs> enough to change. <laughs> hey, on a side note, you, you mentioned the school thing. And one of my favorite lines that you've ever dropped on the air, I, I, it reminds me of that line. When you told Doug Glanville, uh, I, do you remember what, where I'm, I'm leading? Uh, so oh, yeah. you, you went to junior college and uh, didn't participate much. Of course, he's a Penn grad. What, what did you tell Doug when you guys were in the booth in ESPN? I told Doug, I said, you know, I said, I said, you want to know something ironic? I said, you go to a, 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 a Ivy League school and I went to JUCO and we have the same damn job. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'm certain that most of the kids that go to uh, Ivy League schools don't have the same jobs as uh, uh, junior college graduates would be my, <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah, I, I, would, I would assume that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that line. All right. So you're out there in Walla Walla and the minor leagues are starting. You're a professional baseball player. You're probably looking around thinking, how did I get here in, in so many different ways? Um, what do you, what do you remember about that early time? Now you, you played very well in the minor leagues. I mean, you, you progressed very quickly. Uh, you did exactly what they were hoping you were going to do. You hit. Um, but uh, what do you, do you, do you have fond memories of, of the minor leagues? Yeah, I, I loved them. I, you know, I, I, it was, uh, well, my first roommate, in uh, Walla Walla was Tony Gwynn, and uh, that that was life changing to me. Uh, you know, he was just so much better than everyone else. And I'm like, man, if I ever have a dream of playing in the big leagues, I got to figure out a way to keep up. Well, that year I couldn't keep up. Tony, uh, he was gone after like a month or so, month and a half. Wow. Uh, you know, he was just too good for the the Northwest League at that time, and I was struggling like 240 something like that, and. Like and I, I actually went home uh, after that season, and uh, told my told my dad. I said, you know, I said I, I can't do this. I said these guys, you know, you had all these guys from big colleges, and they're throwing, you know, in the '90s with movement, and I've never seen that before. And uh, so I told my dad. I said, you know, I said I'm done. I said I, I, I there's no way I compete with these guys. He said that's fine. He said do you know if that's what you feel, go ahead and do it. 
Well, the next morning, he woke me up like six o'clock. And I'm like, the hell you wake me up at six o'clock? He said, you're going to work with me. And I spent a half a day at work with him. And I'm like, I, I, I told him after lunch, I said, I'm going home. He said, you ain't done yet. I said, no, I'm going to go figure out how to hit. <laughs> and, uh, so I went and started hitting. And, uh, uh, you know, I had great guys helping me. Leo Mazzoni, you know, the former pitching coach yep. of the Braves. Sam Perlazzo was a coach on the 2008 Phillies. Uh, they lived in the area where I grew up, and uh, they would they would throw BP to me, Sam Wrighty, Leo Lefty, and you know I started figuring some things out about my swing, and and uh, you know Tony Gwynn told me, he said he said the best thing that can happen to you as a player is he said if you could be your own hitting coach, or you don't you can fix yourself in the middle of an at bat if you feel like something's going wrong, and. Uh, that was the greatest advice I ever learned. I really started studying my swing. I didn't use video like Tony did, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, you know, I would, I would, uh, you know, feel things in my swing. So, and, and then after that, uh, I, I went to Reno the next year in a ball and, uh, Jack Maloof was our manager and hitting coach back then. We only had two coaches. It's not like now where they have like 57 coaches, <laughs> like five for each player. Yep. But, uh, and, and Jack, uh, one day, just he said, "Look," he said, uh, uh, "In spring training, he said, look, you're you're not going to make a team." He said, "But but he said I, I see something in you, so I'm going to push for you." And you know, luckily for me, Kevin McReynolds, who was the first round pick in 1981, same year I was drafted, uh, he he had hurt his knee playing at the University of Arkansas. So they wanted him to just go and DH. So they had to carry an extra outfielder. And I was that extra outfielder. Right. And someone got hurt. One of the other outfielders got hurt. I got a chance. And uh, Jack Maloof was just uh, like a, a sent from heaven to me because he he got me because I had a really close stance and I was getting, I mean, oh my God, I was getting eaten up alive inside. And so Jack one day said, he said, come out early. He said, I want to try something with you. He said, but he said, the good thing he told me, he said, if you're comfortable, try it. If you're not, then we'll figure something else out. And he had me open my stance, get my hands up a little higher. And uh, I remember my first at bat that night, I hit a ball to right field, which I don't think I've ever done in my life okay. uh, for a home run, hit the swimming pool uh, in Reno behind the right field fence. And I'm coming around third and, and Jack, uh, Jack's a, a Christian man. <laughs> and uh his you know instead of saying the f word he would say suck an a you know <laughs> and i remember coming around 30 said suck an a how you like that swing and i said i think i'm keeping this one jack and uh, i just i just started hitting uh and felt comfortable and got confident and uh you know from there it just it just kind of took off and went crazy yeah as baseball often does. I mean, it's such a game of confidence and, you know, little, little changes here and there, but when you find something that's working for you, you stick with it and you pretty much, I mean, I'm picturing that swing in my head and that that's how I envisioned your swing in the big leagues. Right. I mean, you pretty much kept that for the most part, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was funny because, uh, it was very unorthodox. Uh, and I remember playing in triple a, we were playing the Phillies triple a team in Portland. Mm-hmm. And they had a certain catcher on that team who lately, uh, at the time, I couldn't stand him because he was too pretty. I thought he was too pretty to play baseball. Right. Uh, but, you know, he became my brother in uh, 1989 when I got traded to the Phillies and Darren. And I remember going in, stepping in the box, and I stood far away from home, but I dove toward the plate. And so I took my stance. Darren called timeout. And I looked down, I'm like, all right, he must not got the signs right or something. And he said, uh, and I did it again. I got back in the box and took my stance. He called timeout again. And he looks at me and he goes, are you going to get in the box and hit? I said, this is the way I hit. I said, I'm ready. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, well, there ain't no way you can touch a pitch outside. Like we're having this conversation so great. while I'm hitting. And, and he threw the first pitch, whoever the pitcher was, down and away. And I hit a double to left field, hit the wall, you know, off the wall, almost hit that mermaid. They used to have a mermaid on the wall out there in, uh, in Portland at the field that the Phillies played on. And, uh, and, oh, my God, Darren was pissed. I mean, he was pissed. Like, how in the hell could you? Re so we went on and on. Every time we play, we go on and on about 
my stance and whatever. And, uh, and, uh, but I, I just remember that time, like it, it you know, here's a guy trying to tell me how to hit right. and he was pretty. And, uh, you know, <laughs> at, at that point I hated him, but you know, thank God. Things would uh, change. Yeah. Yeah. Things would change dramatically, which, yeah. uh, which I was very pleased about. But the first guy, and you mentioned him already, the first guy, you, you arrive in the big leagues in uh, 1986 uh, with the Padres. Uh, again, after a pretty quick rise through the minor leagues, and, you know, after that first uh, get-out-of-the-gate season, you really did, you know, swing the bat well down in the minor leagues. So you get to San Diego. What do you remember about your, your rookie season? What do you remember about your debut? And, and the guy I'm, I'm referring to, of course, is Tony Gwynn, who was there with the Padres at the time. So you had that, you know, that comfort level with – one of their superstars at the time. Uh, what was that all like for you when you first got there? Yeah, you know, it's it, it was different for me because, uh, um, like, my first big league invite to spring training, I made the team. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an unbelievable spring, and, and uh, you know, Tony was just uh, – Tony and Kevin McReynolds, because I roomed with Kevin and A-ball and, uh, and, and Tony and rookie ball, of course, but uh, – you know, it, they were just like, Hey, you know, you know, good luck. Uh, you know, I, you know, we're, they were loaded in the outfield. They had Tony, Kevin McReynolds, Carmelo Martinez, who Jack McKean, I think traded for the year before. And they were very high on him. They had Bobby Brown on the bench and, you know, Jack McKean and I, I don't know what happened, but for, <laughs> some, for some reason he and I didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Yeah. Cause I was, I, I guess I talk too much, I, I, you know, from what, from what I gather, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, I, I, I can trash talk when, you know, in the locker room with the guys and stuff like that. I don't know if Jack really appreciated, uh, you know, Jack wanted more, you know, quiet, grinded out type of guys. And I grinded out, but I wasn't quiet about it. Yeah. Especially uh, from a young player. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, I had an unbelievable spring that year. And, you know, Tony and Kevin helped me a lot with just, you know, confidence, confidence, stay confident. You never know what's going to happen. There might be a trade. There might be this. There might be that. Uh, and so uh, we played in Las Vegas two games against the Twins uh, to finish our uh, spring training schedule, mm -hmm. exhibition schedule. And like I said, I mean, I, 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 I led the team in, in the spring in home runs, RBIs, batting average. I mean, I pretty much led in everything because I felt like I had to. Uh, and so uh, I remember uh, uh, after the game, and that's where our AAA team was in Las Vegas. So I remember after the game, I thought, you know, I, I got a good feeling I'm going to San Diego after this is over. And uh, Jack McKeon called me in. He said, well, I've had to make a tough decision. And I said, I said, all right, well, what is it? And he said, uh, he said, we're going to keep you here. And I just snapped. And, and I'm like, you know what? If I've spent five years in the minor leagues. I've done everything y'all have asked me to do. I said, you can, you know, you can go do whatever to yourself. I don't really care. I said, I quit. I'm going home. So I, I'm steaming and I'm in my locker packing my stuff up because I, I, I don't know how I had my car was there. Uh, because, you know, we drove from Yuma to Palm Springs and then Palm Springs over to Las Vegas to finish the season. And we had an off day. So we were all going to drive back to San Diego. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I was packing and I was done. I told him, I said, I quit. And, uh, uh, Bobby Brown, who was, uh, the fourth outfielder and he was a jokester and, uh, he came over and he said, Hey man, congratulations. I said, I look at him and said, congratulations for what? He said, uh, he said, you had a great spring. I said, yeah, but I'm staying here. I said, I'm not staying here. I said, I'm going home. I quit. I said, that fat, you know, what can go, you know, do what to himself <laughs> referring to, uh, the general manager, uh, didn't endear me to him either after that, no. but, uh, and Bobby started laughing. He had this distinct laugh. It was unbelievable. And, uh, and I jumped up, I wanted to fight him. Now he'd have killed me because Bobby was a huge man. But at that point I, I you know, I'm, I figured I got, you know, the rest of my life to heal. So I might as well give it a shot. <laughs> and, uh, but he just kept laughing and I'm like, Bobby, I said, I, I, I don't want to hear. 
He said, no, man. He said, you, he goes, you made the team. I went and told him I, I, I don't deserve it. I said, you're a better player than I am right now. And uh, I told Jack McKeon I'm retiring. And I'm like, oh, dear God. And this is after I talked to Jack McKeon like I talked to him. <laughs> Bobby said, well, here's the thing. You got to go back in and meet with him. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> God. And so <laughs> I went in and they had a major league contract and I signed it and I'm like, well, oh, man, I said, this is, uh, uh, you know, I, it's not I, the I way you, I, not the way you drew it up. Right. Yeah. It's not the way you want to start <laughs> off with your, uh, you know, first days in the big leagues with having the general manager pissed off at you. But, uh, uh, you know, things that happen. Relationship so never really got a whole lot better. If I'm right, if I'm right. Right. No, yeah, it did so. not. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I knew it was a matter of time. Uh, before I was out of there, um, yeah. you know, I, I, I really think when Larry Boa took over as manager, uh, he was told not to play me and, you know, Larry thought, you know, like, uh, you know, he's, he's one of our best hitters on the team. And so I, he got, I got to play, him. you know, if we want to win, I got to play him. So, you know, Larry stuck his neck out for me and, uh, uh you know, it was, it was, uh, it was a fun ride. Yeah. Now that relationship has gotten stronger as the years have gone by <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll hear from Larry uh, later on in this show. So, uh, but we'll talk to him about that, but, um, let me just look at your numbers right now. Bat you bet at three Oh nine, your rookie year, you finished seventh in the rookie of the year voting. So, I mean, you had a really good season Then you bet at three thirteen, And then in 1988, your final year with the Padres, you batted uh, 241, and and so it, a dramatic change. And now baseball, it, that happens sometimes. But uh, there were some extenuating circumstances for you as uh, you went through that 1988 season, was there not? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I decided to have the junior slump instead of the sophomore slump. Yes. I told you I was always slow in school, so it took me a while to get going. But, uh, yeah, you know, I had a couple buddies of mine I grew up with, uh, known them pretty much all my life. Um, and, uh, you know, they, one of them had a, a, a business that, uh, he sold and he, you know, he called me and he said, Hey, he said, uh, you mind if we come out to San Diego and visit? I said, no, come on out. It'd be great to have someone. Cause I, I was like, going, I think, uh, I, I think I was the only, um, single guy on the team. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, after games, I didn't have anyone to hang out with. Right. So I thought, well, this would be good. You know, I have buddies out here, you know, we can hang out. And I thought they were only going to stay for like a week or two, but they said, Hey, we like it out here. We want to stay. So they rented a house and, uh, and I moved in with them. And, and, uh, so, you know, I'm sitting there one day, this is probably, Oh shoot. Four months into the season mm -hmm. or not even that it, it had to be your, no, it was, it was right after spring training. And, uh, so I'm sitting in there. And uh, in San Diego in the locker room, and uh, these guys come up to me in suits. They said, hey, we need to talk to you. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. I said, sit down. They said, no, not here. We got to go somewhere else. And I'm like, well, this is where I talk to everyone. I said, sit down. And I, I thought they were too well-dressed to be reporters. Yes. <laughs> uh, nice suits, too. But uh, the one guy kind of flashed his bag, badge at me. And... Uh, he said, uh, we need to go to another place. So I'm like, you, oh boy. And I'm starting to think, you know, I, I did some things I probably shouldn't have done at that point in my <laughs> life. So now I'm thinking, what the hell did I do that the FBI is coming out here? And so they took me in a room. They told me what they were here for. And apparently they had been following me for a year. Um, uh, yeah, so they've been following me for like a year. And, uh, you know, and I and they said, this is how we know you're not involved. I said, well, involved in what? And they said, uh, the two guys from your buddies from West Virginia, he said they've been robbing banks. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> I know one of them drove my car back from San Diego to West Virginia one off season. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, and they said, yeah, Blue Bronco. And I said, mm-hmm. <laughs> They said, yeah, that was used in one of I mean, uh, four of them or so eventually. And, you know, uh, I, I, and, and they couldn't understand. People couldn't understand how I didn't know. But, you know, I got to the ballpark at one o'clock. I didn't get right. back till, you know, one o'clock in the morning. 
uh, you know, it wasn't like I was knocking on their door saying, Hey, what are you guys doing tonight? You know, I just, you know, and then I'd go on the road for, you know, extended period of time. So I had no idea what was going on in that house. People didn't understand that. Yeah. And, and, uh, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, from what I gather, they arrested, uh, right. the one, the one, the one, uh, they caught and, uh, he turned state's evidence on the other one and uh they caught the other one i'm out i'm out now i have since moved out of that place thank god yes but he found out where i lived and they caught him like a mile from my house and uh from what i understand from what some people in the fbi have told me he was coming to kill me because if someone told him that i was the one who called the fbi on him and ratted him out mm -hmm. uh but you know, so you called, lived in a little bit of fear there for a while, though. Well, I was, I, yeah, I was, I, I couldn't go home. Like I would go, like in the daytime, just to get clothes. Uh, but I was staying in different hotels, uh, pretty much every night in San Diego, uh, just to, uh, you know, try to feel like to be safe. You know, yeah. I, I didn't, you know, they look. I know, I know the guy. He was one of those survivalist guys. Like he can go out in the woods and live for, you know, years with right. just a pocket knife. Uh, <laughs> you know, he was he was that. He, you know, he was uh, he was into the survival mode. Uh, but uh, you know, after he got sentenced, uh, he got sentenced to 16 years, and, he, and they sentenced him to a prison, I believe, in Kentucky. And uh, I got a collect phone call this before cell phone. So, you know, they called the home phone. It was a collect call from him. And we talked for a long time and, you know, he said, look, he said, I, I, I had a cocaine addiction and I needed to, uh, uh, you know, I, I needed money cause I needed yeah. to have it. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, he, he apologized. He said, man, he goes, I, I, I saw where you didn't have a great year. And I, and he said, I understand why. <laughs> he said, I can't. And, and, and yeah and so he said i just i hope i didn't ruin your career and i said well, i said well you you've got a good start on it uh, <laughs> let's hope we can recover from this but uh you know I, I felt bad like you know i i growing up i knew people that were on drugs and and uh and stuff like that i never saw that from him though Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, like, uh, you know, my next door neighbor growing up is, uh, you know, he, he got on drugs so bad, like he, he was in a, a, a institutionalized for, you know, basically brain was fried. Right. And, uh, right. and, uh, so I, I saw that side and I knew it, but I didn't see that with him. And, uh, oh shoot. I don't know how many years ago, uh, you know, he got out of jail and, my nephew called me and said, you ain't believe who I saw <laughs> uh, or I met today. I said, who? He said, his wife. I said, where'd you meet his wife? I said, I didn't even know he's married. He said, she runs a bank <laughs> in, Fairmont, in Fairmont, West Virginia. She's the oh, come on. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, apparently uh, she actually called me when I was working at ESPN and started talking to me about uh, – him uh and and all the stuff he was doing to her threatening her and oh, whatever man. and uh you know apparently he he started robbing banks again and they caught him and uh he was up in the mountains in west virginia from what i understand and he ended up uh they had him cornered and he just said the heck with it and killed himself wow God, it's it's yeah, such it's a crazy story. It's a tragic story. It really is. Yeah. Uh, but as it relates to your baseball career, it's a significant one because uh, I can imagine the stress that you might have been under when you didn't know which way it was going to be going. So yeah, and and the problem was I wasn't allowed to tell anyone. Right, right. I could. so so after the meeting with the FBI, I got called in and they wanted to put me in the Betty Ford Clinic. <laughs> I'm like, what? What? What do I need to go there for? They said, anytime the FBI pulls a player out of the locker room, it's got to be drug related. So we're putting you in. I'm like, I tell you what, throw my ass in the Betty Ford clinic and I'm going to have our union on your, you know, up right. yours uh, right. uh, until we get this thing settled. Because I'll take a drug test right now. I'm not on drugs. I don't do drugs. Yeah. And uh, 
they kind of backed off and, but I mean, it was, uh, uh, it was, it, it was just so difficult to focus on baseball. And everyone says, you know, in, in tragic times that, you know, being on the baseball field was, uh, you know, therapeutic. Uh, this wasn't therapeutic to me at all because, you know, the FBI told me, they said, he has a, he, he you know, he has weapons. I said, Oh God. Yeah. I've said, I've witnessed them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at two in the morning when we're up in a mountain. So we're trying to hunt deer with the 357 Magnum. You know, <laughs> it, uh, it wasn't, you know, I, I knew what he was all about. I mean, he yeah. was, like I said, he's, but, uh, uh, so yeah, so I, 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 uh, uh, you know, I, I, you know, was I going to get shot while I was playing? Was I, you know, was that the way he was going to get me? Uh, uh, so I, I mean, it was, uh, you know, you're, you're hitting and your mind's wandering of, you know, I'm a pretty good target right here because I can't really move a whole lot. Right. Uh, so it was, it was That's uh, a tough very, way to hit. Yeah. yeah it, I found it difficult. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, being heckled one thing, but uh, yeah, being oh, shot at yeah. a, a whole nother thing. Uh, interesting that you would be a part of the movie, the fan many, many, yeah. many years <laughs> later <laughs> with a similar theme, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 We're uh, yeah. Crazy. A crazed fan one. At least, at least uh, in, in the movie, they didn't know each other. Right. Uh, right. You know, yeah. That's it, true. It, all right. Well, let me bring you, let me, you know, so you, you come back in 89 with the Padres, uh, but not for long, 31 games. And then you're on your way to Philadelphia. And so you're headed back to the East coast. And I guess in some ways that might've been a positive for you in terms of, uh, you know, being closer to the family and all that. However, um, Philly's not a very good team at the time. What do you, what do you remember about uh, when you got the news that you were headed out there? I was happy. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I needed, I needed a change. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I, I don't think there's many guys that would say, you know, I'd rather be in Philly than San Diego. <laughs> uh, you know, San Diego is just an unbelievably great place to live. Yeah. But you know, the way I grew up, like my dad was really tough on us as far as playing the right way and doing things the right way. And so, uh, you know, and, and Larry Bo and I had, conversations about Philly and what it was like playing there. And then after he got fired, he said, you know, Hey, look, you know, we're going to try to get you over there. He said, because, you know, Jack McKeon took over as manager. Right. And, uh, he said, you know how that's going to go for you. I said, yeah, I said, yeah, I said, uh, I'll be picking splinters for most right. of the time he's here. And so I, I just remember when Jack called me in and, uh, uh, we were in Cincinnati and he called me in after game and he said, uh, yeah, he told me this is the toughest thing he ever had to do. I'm like, man, don't blow smoke, <laughs> man. I, you know, either tell me I'm being sent down or tell me that you're trading me. And he said, well, we, we traded you to the Phillies. And I was like, so happy because I knew I'd be reunited with Larry. Right. Um, you know, and, and I, and I had, my only concern was my relationship with Darren at the time. Right. Uh, How about that? But uh, when I first walked in there, though, me and Randy Reddy got traded together. And Randy was similar to me that, you know, we were kind of loud and kind of, you know, had our own ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking in there and that, I mean, it was like, it was like a morgue. I mean, it was, you know, Schmidt had just retired. Um you know, they had a bunch of really quiet guys. Tommy heard Darren was quiet at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Juan Samuel was quiet at the time. Von Hayes was quiet. I mean, they were just had a, you know, a whole bunch of guys that were just really quiet. And, and, and again, when you're not, when you're a bad team, there's not a whole lot to talk about, but you know, I looked at Randy and, and I said, man, I said, uh, I said, we got to liven this place up a little bit or else this is going to be disastrous. You know, watching these guys go around like, uh, you know, they, they just lost their puppies, you know. I mean, it, it was it was just, it wasn't fun. It wasn't a fun place to start. But, you know, after a while, I started making more trades. You know, we got Lenny and Roger McDowell. And, you know, Roger was a funny oh, personality. Yeah. Yep. Lenny was Lenny. Yep. Um, and so things started to change. And then we got Terry Mulholland and Dennis Cook. Terry was quiet. Charlie Hayes was quiet, but Dennis Cook was a riot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I looked at Spikey one day, Randy Reddy, Spikey. But I looked at him one day and I said, hey, man, I said, thanks for starting to turn around. It looks like we might have some fun. 
Uh, that and that's the one thing I wish. I wish Randy would have been a part of our our '93 team, but he got right. traded off before that. But uh, uh, I, you know, I wish he would have. I wish he'd have been part of that team because we. Oh my God, that'd have been a blast with him. Yeah, he. He. You're right. He's what a great personality. Uh, Randy Reddy has. For sure. Well, things did start to turn around, obviously. I mean, in uh, uh, you, nine, the team was slower. You're uh, particularly, you kind of took off a little bit, an all-star in 91, all-star in 92, even though the teams weren't very good at that point. And then you get to 93, and, and I know you've talked about this, and we've talked to so many of your teammates on the podcast already, but, uh, you know, there was this real sense inside that clubhouse that, hey, you know what? We could do this. No one else thought that very, very few people around baseball thought that you guys could be anything, but that inside that clubhouse led by Darren Dalton, you guys really did believe in yourselves. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, was it 92? I think Darren led the league in RBIs. And, and when he did that, I thought, you know what? I said, uh, he's ready to take off and yeah. be that guy we needed. And Jimmy Fergosi called him in and said, you know, I need you. I need, he talked there and he said, I need you to be the leader. I need you to, you know, run this clubhouse. And man, did he do a heck of a job. Darren and I were in Philly 90, the winter of 92. And we went to the Ruth Chris downtown by the, uh -huh. uh, to, to, to have dinner. And we ran into Lee Thomas, who was the general manager at the yep. time and Jimmy Fergosi. And so, uh, you know, we went over and talked to him and, and, uh, and Lee looked at Darren and I, and he said, uh, Hey, uh, uh, we got a choice between these three left. We need a lefty starter. And we got a choice between this guy, this guy, and this guy I said, which one do you want? And without hesitation, almost like we rehearsed it, Danny Jackson, because we thought Danny would fit in with us. Yep. And we knew, uh, you know, when he pitched for the red, just, you know, how, how much of a competitor he was, but, uh, you know, the, you know, we didn't, I don't think we fared too well against Danny as a team. And so we thought, you know, let's, let's get, you know, that would be the guy. And then lo and behold, they went out and got him. And, uh, you know, then we got Izzy came in and, uh, I mean, it just, the, the team that they put together, uh, and, and it might've been the only year I've ever played that 25 guys were unselfish. Uh, and, and you don't find that much anymore. You know, right. it was whatever's best for the team. Cause you know, Mickey and Mariano um, platooned Inky and Milt platooned mm -hmm. at Wes and Izzy platooned. And uh, you know, you don't find that anymore in baseball. Uh, you know, guys need their, you know, they won't, if, if I'm going to get paid, I need, you know, 500 at bats, but you know, these guys put egos aside and said, you know, what's best for the team, what, whatever will help us win we really did believe that we were better than what everyone said. And we didn't start. I don't think we spring training. We had a belief that we could do some damage in our division. Right. Uh, but, you know, once we got off to a, the start, we got off to, we're like, you know, we're better than everyone else in this division. And there's no, there's no doubt in our minds and our confidence just took off. And, you know, Lenny had an unbelievable year and Darren had a great year and Dave Hodge. I mean, we just, uh, you know, it, it all clicked and, but the, the great thing about that team was, is our bench was always fresh mm -hmm. because they were always getting at bats. Uh, you know, you see guys now, uh, you know, that might not, you know, maybe get one at bat a week. You know, our guys were getting, you know, seven or eight, 10 at bats a week, which exactly. for, With the for platoon, bench yeah. players. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cause of the platoons and yeah. that, that made our bench that much better. And, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it was it, it was just fun because, like you said, it, you know, everyone, not that we paid attention a whole lot, but everyone did pick us to finish dead last again. And, uh, uh, you know, not that you go out and play to try to show people uh, to, you know, show them differently. No, uh, it's an added bonus. You know, <laughs> that you were wrong, but it, it really felt good uh, when, once we got rolling that, you know, now all of a sudden these people – who said, oh, they stink, they're going to finish last. Now, all of a sudden, they wanted interviews and all this other stuff. I'm like, yeah, you didn't want one in the spring, did you? <laughs> uh, but, but you, you know, well. it, it, we talked to Larry, a couple, Larry Anderson a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things that we, he was talking about this particular year for him 
He said that, you know, the other part of it was, and, and, and look, it's well documented. You guys would stay late in the trainer's room. You'd talk baseball, you'd drink the beers, you'd do all that stuff. But even more than that, you guys played hard on the field, but played hard away from the field too. And, and there were nights and mornings when probably most people would have counted you out. And Larry said, you know, you all, sometimes you counted yourself out right up until game time. And then everybody to a man, no matter what had happened the night before was ready to play. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, there was a lot of, but like, uh, when it started getting hot, we would stretch in, the in the clubhouse. And uh, instead of going out on the field, because, you know, the turf was burning hot and we, yeah. you know, it'd be five or six of us around there stretching. And uh, yeah, I mean, we'd look at each other like, oh, my God, I said, well, you know, maybe we should have had one less uh, <laughs> last night. But it just seemed like when the when that bell rung, we were ready to go. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I really think talking to players from other teams, I really think because of how hard we played and how aggressive we were. I, I think we intimidated a lot of yeah. teams and, yeah. uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think teams were that enthused with, uh, you know, wanting to get into a hard played game with us. Right. Right. And, and I think the one word that maybe describes 93, um, best when you just look at that roster, it was accountability. You guys were all accountable to one another and ultimately accountable to Darren, who was your, your, you know, de facto leader. Um, you know, he made sure that you were all accountable to one another. Yeah. Uh, and that was huge. Yeah. Um, you know, cause like, I mean, you've been around most of us. I mean, you know, there was some strong, sure. outgoing <laughs> kind of crazy personalities on that team. And Darren, you know, look, before games, we goofed off and fooled around and, you know, Larry painting his hair and Mitch driving that go-kart around the field during batting practice and stuff like that. Like, but, uh, yeah, once, once it hit seven o'clock or whatever, I mean, it was game on and Darren was, a, uh, you know, Darren would just sit back and observe and watch, you know, the, the craziness that went on. And, uh, but once it was time to go, he, he, he knew how to rein us in and, and look, you, you, you didn't feel like you were part of the team unless he called you back in the back room in the videos room and, uh, and, uh, had a talking to you. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, and I don't think anyone, I don't, I don't really think anyone was, uh, you know, out of the 24 other guys, uh, I don't think there was, there might've been a couple guys that, uh, uh, probably avoided the room with Darren, but uh, most Izzy of us. Izzy, maybe. <laughs> most, thinking, Izzy, yeah. Mickey, it's it, you, Stalker, uh, you know, Milt. Milt was, you know, always yep. ready to go. Uh, but, you know, he he called me in one day for, uh, uh, there was a ball hit to me that he thought I should have turned a double play on. And I took the out at first. And, uh, and uh, you know, he's, came in and said, come here. I want to talk to you. I said, what? He goes, he goes, you can throw. He said, you're a good thrower of the baseball. He said, do it. He said, we can't, if we get a double play ball, ground ball, we got to turn a double play. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, from here on out, if you have a chance of getting a double play, you better throw it. And he said, if it, if it doesn't work, I'll take the blame for it. Uh, but you know, we got to turn double plays. We can't make our pitchers stay out there and pitch to, you know, throw more pitches and pitch to, you know, give them, give them extra outs in an inning. And that was it. Yeah. And you know, he hugged me, kissed me and we went and had a beer. Yeah. And and you probably, the next time you had that chance, you probably threw it down a second. I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's I, awesome. I tell you what though, I worked hard on it. You know, because I'm like, you know, and there's the other part of it, right? So he tells you to do that. I, I'll take the, I'll take the blame for it. But you're not going to want to disappoint. So you're going to go out there and make sure that you've got it down. And that, I mean, yes. you know, it, it's brilliant leadership in in so many ways. Yeah, I mean, he didn't have to tell me. I want you out here tomorrow, right? To to, to work on your throws to second because he knew I could throw. I just made a bad decision, and and that's what he was telling me. He said he said we can't have bad decisions. We have to be perfect. Yeah. And uh, uh, so I, I work on it and, 
Not that I felt like I needed to work on it because I always thought I was a good thrower. Right. But, uh, you but know, you in did. the world, well, in, in, in uh, I forget what game in the World Series, we turned a double play on a bunt that I fielded through the second, got the out at first. There you and, go. And, uh, you know, that is Darren and Larry Boa. Larry Boa. Oh, my God, I hated him. Every <laughs> <laughs> uh suffice to say that that's no longer the case you you hated him in the best possible way is, is the way you yes. hated him yeah yeah yes. no doubt yeah, um, it's, it's weird though i hated him for trying to make me better does right. that make sense it, well it makes complete sense uh you know that's that's father to son that's coach to player i mean yeah. that that's that's the age old that's the age old story and uh yeah. the most successful people most of them have that story somewhere in their in their yeah, I, I don't I wouldn't I know I wouldn't have been the player if it wasn't for him I mean yeah. he brought intensity as a manager even though he tried to keep me down in triple a longer mm-hmm. uh you know he told Jack McKean I wasn't really swinging well and I was hitting like <laughs> 460 or because he didn't want to lose you <laughs> yeah that's what he said but yeah. eventually he caved in but that's, you know every cool. day Clearwater you know Jack Russell we had that half field back there at turf seven o'clock every morning he'd walk by my locker you know go let's go with a bucket of balls and and a fungo bat and he goes let's go bitch time to work <laughs> and uh, that's how i learned how to play first base because of yeah. him I mean, it's, he it's awesome me. It's awesome. Not a surprise that the, the name, so many of the names you, you've mentioned over the course of this last 40 minutes are guys that are still very much involved in the game because, uh, because they were, they were baseball men, baseball players and coaches. And uh, so many of them, you know, that's why, that's why they're still around because of the way they, yeah. they it's the way they taught the game. Um, and it, it's so important. Uh, I know I'm running out of time with you. So I just want to, I want to ask you about, so 94, obviously you go through your medical scare, uh, mm-hmm. again, certainly well-documented the testicular cancer, you probably came back sooner than you should have, but, uh, that was, that was you, right. You just wanted to get back. Yeah. You know, we were, we were the defending national league champions and, yeah. uh, you know, I, I was going through radiation and so I had to miss the first six games. I think they played in, I think we played in Colorado and Cincinnati first six games of the season then we came home and I was still getting radiation treatments but I went in and told uh Jimmy uh opening day and a home opener I told Jimmy and Lee Thomas I said I want to play and they're like well you haven't been medically cleared I said well then let's call my doctor so my doctor at the time was at Jefferson uh he's since moved on Dr. Carl Mansfield uh and so they called him and he said, look, if he feels like he can play, then, you know, he's not going to hurt himself. So, you know, let him play. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I had gone through a radiation treatment that morning and it was a day game, the home opener. And, uh, you know, I, I knew I'd get really tired because I got tired because I was yeah. getting, uh, you know, five days a week, I was getting radiation treatment. And, uh, and, and it did wear me down. Uh, and, and I didn't have really, ha- I didn't have any spring training. I, I, uh, Dickie Knowles would throw to me out on the vet and it was frozen most of the time. And, uh, Mage McDonald, we got into the, uh, Eagles practice bubble and Mage would hit me grounders. <clears throat> How about that? But he could only hit me grounders to me because they, they had to cut open my feet to do a thing called a limp angiogram. So I still had stitches in my feet and that was, you know, so he, I couldn't laterally move. So he would have to hit him right at me. And, uh, and, but that was my spring training. And, uh, you know, they agreed, Jimmy Lee said, look, it, it's up to you. If you think you can play, uh, you know, then, then you're in there. I said, thank God. I, 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 that's, that's all I want. Cause we didn't get off to a good start those first six games. No. And like I said, I just, you know, defending National League champs, and I just wanted to be out there to try to help. And, uh, uh, but it's a decision I wish I wouldn't have made. Um, more stubborn than intelligent. Uh, you, you've known me for a long time, Murph. I don't yep. put a lot of thought into a lot of things. And that was, <laughs> that was really one of them that I had, didn't put any thought into. Because after the first, two games i mean i was wiped out yeah. i mean because i was you know i I'd, I'd have to get up at like six in the morning drive down to jefferson 
get my yeah. treatment, and then go to the ballpark and try to sleep. Right. And, and the it, treatment it, itself just would have been tearing your body apart. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah it, I, it was, it was, it wasn't smart. I, I wonder, you know, how much uh, you being back was important for your mental health though. You know what I mean? Like you're yeah. a ball player. You knew that you wanted to be around the guys you wanted to be with your teammates. Um, you know, in, in some ways, maybe that was a good decision, perhaps not the physical side of it, but maybe the mental side of it. So. Yeah. Uh, it, that was, uh, you know, that was, that was where I was most comfortable in that, yeah. in that clubhouse with those, with those guys. Uh, you know, I, I, I really can't say I disliked anyone on that team. I, I, you know, it was, it was, uh, you know, different quirky personalities. We had some strong personalities, mm -hmm. but, uh, I just wanted to be back there. I didn't want to go home after treatment and sit and watch the game on TV. Like I had to watch the first six. I wanted to be with them. Right. Uh, it probably would have been smart if I'd have just sat in the dugout. And then if I got tired, <laughs> go up in the trainer's room and try to sleep. Yeah. But, yeah. It's hard to sleep I at first base. <laughs> yeah. Dude, what the hell I'm there. I mean, I was, might as well play, but right. uh, yeah, Jimmy called me in and he said, you're not playing tomorrow. I said, why not? He said, because he said, you've turned yellow. And, and I, I guess I lost like, God, he said I lost color in my face because it looked like I was going to drop over. But uh, uh, so I, 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 yeah, he would set me out occasionally, yeah. different games here and there. But uh, yeah, it was stupid. I should have waited. <laughs> but, well, well, yeah, you no know, no brain, no headache, Murph. No brain, exactly no headache. Exactly right. Exactly right. All right. And before I say goodbye, real quick, uh, 95, you move on to the White Sox. You only play 45 games. You decide to, to call it quits in the middle. You know, 10 years uh, in the big leagues. And at that point, you said enough is enough. It just wasn't fun for you anymore at that point, right? You just thought, you know what? There's lots of other things that I want to accomplish before uh, it's all said and done. And, uh, and you hung them up. Yeah, it, it became a chore. Um, it, it became a job. And I, and I, I, I always told myself that if this ever becomes where I feel like it's work, I need to get out. And, uh, so we, we, I thought we were a decent team, you know, I mean, my God, they had one of the greatest hitters ever and Frank Thomas, Frank Thomas on that team with geez, he was unbelievable. But I told Jim Abbott, Jim was our best pitcher. And I told Jim, I said, if you get traded, I'm retiring. He said, cause they talked about trading him at the, trade deadline and i you know that means you know they're waving Enough. the white towel and yep. you know i i just uh, you know like i said it's become a chore to go to the ballpark every day and so uh uh we got to boston and jim called me and he says hey he goes i just got traded i think he got traded back to the angels and uh, and i'm like wow i've wasn't prepared a day later to retire. But. <laughs> so I went up to his room and uh, Ozzie Guillen was up there and Robin Ventura and Kurt McCaskill. I think Scott Radinsky might've been up there too. And so, uh, you know, I didn't say anything. I just, you know, we had, we were drinking a beer and talking about Jim and how we're going to miss him and all that stuff. And he looked at me and he goes, are you going to retire now? And I'm like, Oh crap. He remembered. And so, uh, I said, yeah, I'm done. And so Kurt McCaskill and Ozzy and Robin and them, they came up with this brilliant idea. You know, you have issues. And I said, well, yeah, that's yeah. It's documented. But uh, <laughs> they said, why don't you just get a hit and walk off the field and go home? Well, yeah, I can do that. that. Sounds like a fun idea. Let's do it. So, you know, I had to tell the manager and the general manager that this is what's going to happen. And so they had a guy they called up in Boston from the minor leagues who's going to take my place because they assumed I would get a hit at some point. Okay. Didn't. Oh, for Boston. And uh, I remember we went to Baltimore and uh, uh, I grew up not far from there, like two and two hour, two and a half hours. And so my mom and dad were there and a bunch of my buddies and stuff were down there. So I told my dad on Friday, I said, Dad, I said, uh, I'm retiring if I get a hit. And he said, we'll get that SOB soon because it's supposed to be hotter than hell down here. <laughs> and I want to go home. I'm like, oh, God, you know, that's a little more added pressure after I sucked. But I went 
first game Friday, didn't get a hit in Baltimore. Second day, I pinch hit and struck out. And, but I saw Doug Jones, and Doug was with us in 94 in Philly. And he said, how you doing? I said, well, I need to get one more hit, and that way I can retire. He said, well, when did you decide this? I said, well, the first game in Boston. He said, you didn't get any hits in Boston? I said, nope. And so I said, who's pitching Sunday? Because it don't look like I'm going to get a hit anytime soon. And I damn sure didn't want to go back to Chicago. You know, I just, uh, you know, I didn't want to fly back to Chicago and then, you know, have to fly back home or whatever. And so uh, uh, he said, uh, Scott Erickson's pitching. I said, good guy. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. I said, well, can you tell him to throw me a cookie the first pitch so I can get a hit and get the hell out of here? And he said, I tell you what, when you come up for your first at bat tomorrow, I'll wave my hat. And if I wave my hat, that means he's in. I'm walking up the plate, Murph, and I couldn't see Doug Jones. I couldn't find Doug Jones in the Orioles dugout. And I kept looking and looking. I'm like, God, I guess I'm on my own. And here he comes. As soon as I started getting close to the batter's box, he comes running down. He waved his hat. I'm like, oh, thank God. And Scott threw me a fastball pretty much right down the middle and I got jammed and hit a little blooper over Kyle Ripken's head for a base hit and I said I'm done how about that and uh, Rafael Palmero tried to talk me into stay and he said you're hitting over 300 I said yeah but here's the thing I'm on first base now it's going to take four hits to score me my (laughs) my knees were shot like I had seen a doctor in Baltimore and they had to do a uh, it's called a lateral release or something where they have to free up my kneecap because my kneecap kept fraying and cutting into all the cartilage uh-huh. and it basically became bone on bone so they said they would have to do that uh, and he said once we do that you're done playing and so uh so then i thought you know frank thomas was ready to come pinch run for me probably the first time in the history of baseball frank thomas ever was going to pinch run for someone but i kind of waved him back because i wanted to see cow because cow was like in the middle of the streak you know or not in the middle he's closing in uh, you know, on the, on the, uh, you know, most consecutive games yeah. played. Yep. So I think Robin was up behind me and Robin got a base hit and I stopped at second to talk to Cal. And, uh, while he was talking, someone made the third out and, uh, uh, you know, I ran into Doug out. I ran up in the locker room cause, uh, they pretty much knew I was done. And Ozzie Guillen was up there with a bottle of champagne. You know, I came up through the minor leagues with Ozzy four years, love him like a brother. And, uh, you know, we had a toast champagne and I got in the car and drove home wow. and I got home before the game was over. <laughs> yeah, it ended up like 14 to four or something like that. I mean, it was a long game. I remember turning on a TV and, a, and I had a satellite dish. So I got the white Sox game uh, and the white Sox said, yeah, we still haven't heard word. It looked like he was limping, maybe he t- pulled a hamstring or what. No one had any idea. I just went That's home. Unbelievable. That's well, unbelievable. Two weeks, two weeks later, my dang agent called me. He said, are you, are you on the disabled? It was a disabled list at the time. Yep. Are you on the disabled list? And I said, no, why? He said, well, I haven't seen your name in the box score in two weeks. Oh, crap. I forgot to tell yeah. you. I, I meant to call you. <laughs> well, you yes. know what's amazing, John, is that when you think about it, after your first year out there in Walla Walla, you said to yourself, that's it. I'm done. I'm walking away on my own terms. And you get home and dad says to you, you know what? Maybe not yet. Maybe not yet. Yeah. You'll have your chance to walk away on your own terms. And you did. You did yeah. uh, all those many years, years later. later. 15 yeah. years later. It, it's funny. I, I, I was talking to Larry Bow and I told him, I said, you know what's great? I said, we we haven't had a job since we were like 18 years old. We really have the truth. Yeah. We have them. I know. Well, that was 1995 when you retired. And uh, here we are 26 years later. And uh, you've done some other things in your life, but we don't have time for that today. So here's the thing. Glove Stories Season 2 next year will bring John Cruck back and we'll go over the last 25 years and all the stuff and all the yeah. the, uh, the things that you've hey, gotten into. But let's do it somewhere where you we can be together. So yeah, you wouldn't that be nice? Get yeah. on this Zoom thing. Yeah. That that there's a promise. We we can do that for sure. We Thank can do you. that for sure. Uh, in the you, meantime, I, John, I told you, I told you, I scrapped all my daughter's chemistry work. Yeah, yeah. You you crushed her computer trying to get on the Zoom call. Yeah. She's gonna have to redo her chemistry homework. Yeah. Um, but but you did it all for the glove stories, and that's that that should that, be good enough. 
That's more important than chemistry. <laughs> Absolutely is. I mean, whoever got anywhere with chemistry, right? <laughs> no one I know. <laughs> John Crock, thank you so much, man. I will see you. Uh, I'll see you at the ballpark next week. I appreciate you doing this. All right, Murph. Anytime, buddy. You got it. Uh, John Crock, our guest today on Glove Stories with Murph, brought to you by the Parks Casino Sportsbook app and the good folks at Red Robin. We'll be back right after this. Hey everyone, Murph here, and the Parks Sportsbook app is the official sportsbook partner of the real Philly sports fan. Bet on it all. Baseball, golf, MMA, and more. Live, in-game, play-by-play betting lets you bet while you watch. No better way to bet right now than the Parks Sportsbook app. The only sportsbook app backed by the number one casino in Pennsylvania, and the only one I recommend. No one does live, in-game, play-by-play betting better. Bet the money line as it changes during the game on the Park Sportsbook app. Plus, bet on individual player performances. In baseball, you can bet on hits, home runs, and pitcher strikeouts every inning. How about golf? You can bet on match winners, bet on leaders after rounds, and more. New customers sign up right now and get your first bet risk-free up to $500. Just download the app or click parkscasino.com forward slash PA and use promo code ACTION. Do it now. Your first bet risk-free up to $500. Just download the app or click parkscasino.com forward slash PA and use that promo code ACTION. The website has all the details. Get game previews, podcasts, and more on Twitter at Parks Sportsbook. You must be 21 and in Pennsylvania. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Glove Stories with Murph is brought to you by Red Robin. Whether you're hungry for a juicy gourmet burger with bottomless steak fries and an ice cold beer, or a crispy chicken tender salad and freckled lemonade. Whatever you crave, there's something for everyone at Red Robin. So dine in or order curbside to go, delivery or catering. Order online now at order.redrobinpa.com. And welcome back to Glove Stories with Murph. It's the time on the podcast where we revisit some of those great games from the championship season of 1980. And with us to do that is the shortstop from those teams. Of course, Larry Boa is here. And uh, Boa, I'm going to test your memory because we are going back to September 4th, 1980. We're in the final month of the season. Uh, You guys are at Dodger Stadium. And uh, the team began September winning three straight games over San Francisco in San Francisco to start the month. Uh, And I have to ask you, because I don't know if you remember this or not, but the attendance numbers in San Francisco for those late games in September were like 6,000 one night, 7,000 another night. I mean, you look at what San Francisco does nowadays in terms of attendance. There was nobody there. Why was that? Do you remember? Well, one reason was they didn't have a real good team, Murph. And and the other, the weather out there at Candlestick yeah. is terrible, especially yeah. night games. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of us were from out there. I know that my family was out there and Booney's family and Bruce Star and McGraw. So a lot of those 7,000 or 6,000, <laughs> we left a lot of passes for. But I do remember that trip because it was circled. Anytime you go west, Murph. Yep. And you have a big road trip. It doesn't matter who you play out there. Just the fact you're going from east to west. You try to play at least 500. And, uh, and we get out of the gate good. We beat the Giants, a team we were supposed to beat. Exactly. And uh, we felt pretty good about ourselves. And it was on to, uh, to L.A. But uh, the Giants at that time did not have a very good baseball team. Yeah, and, and obviously it showed in their attendance. But it all changed when you got down there to L.A. because uh, the Dodgers did have a very good baseball team. 41,000 on hand to watch this particular game on a Thursday night at Dodger Stadium. You guys come in a half game ahead of the Pirates and a full game ahead of Montreal. So it's a tight race. And I'm seeing some similarities between 1980 and, uh, and 2021 right now. But the, it's a tight race between three teams in the NL East. And uh, you're playing the Dodgers. Um, so let's talk about it uh, first. The Phils got things started quickly, right? Uh, your pitch, uh, pitching was Jerry Royce for the Dodgers. Lonnie Smith singled. Pete Rose grounded out. But then Mike Schmidt hit a home run. It was number 36 of the season. The Phillies led uh, one to nothing at that point. Excuse me, two to nothing at that point. Schmidt was going to go on to hit 48. You think about that. What a monster September Mike Schmidt had in 1980. Yeah, because if you think about it, we were running out of games. For him to go from 36 to 48, yeah, that's incredible. So that gives you uh, an idea how we basically jumped on Schmidt's back the last month of the season because Bull 
really cooled off. I mean, he, you know, Bull noted for long balls. I mean, when I say cooled off, I don't mean he only hit five home runs, but he was 19 or 20 for the year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we needed Schmidt to come up big there, but we got a big outing from uh, Bob Walk in that particular game. And, uh, and Jerry Royce has always been tough on us. He throws that nasty cutter, good velocity. And we went from 7,000 people to over 40,000 people. So the, uh, the environment was awesome. Uh, playing at Dodger Stadium is unbelievable. We're playing a real, real good baseball team in the Dodgers. And we were feeling pretty good our, about ourselves winning three straight in San Francisco. Yeah, no doubt about it. So you mentioned Bob Walk. He was outstanding in this game. He pitched into the fifth inning before he allowed anyone even to get into scoring position. Uh, Royce, though, after the first inning, after the two-run home run by Schmidt, also pitching well. And, you know, the, you know, the Dodgers from top to bottom were a really good team. But Jerry Royce, you know, he's a guy that, uh, that had a really solid career in the big leagues and certainly a lot of great years with the Dodgers. Yeah, you know what he did more than anything, Murph, is he gave right-handers a lot of problems. And you, usually you think, Oh, he's a left-handed pitcher, but he pitched inside hard mm -hmm. with that cutter. Then he'd go fastball or change up away and a good breaking ball. He was always tough on us. And we knew going in that it was going to be a tough game. We weren't going to get eight or nine runs off, off the Dodger pitching staff, no matter how bad they were going at the time or how good we were going. Yeah. They just had good pitching and defense and speed. And uh, we needed this game big time because uh, anytime you go in there and play four with the Dodgers, the first thing, obviously, you want to win them all, but if you can go two and two there, you're feeling pretty good about yourself. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, you're coming in, uh, you know, having won three straight against an inferior team, but still, you got to go out and beat those teams. So uh, right. things were going well. All right, well, top of the seventh, you mentioned Greg Lazinski. He leads off the inning with a home run. It was number 19 on the season, and here we are on September 4th. Believe it or not, it would be his final home run of the regular season, uh, which is hard to believe when you think about a guy who hit, you know, 30 or so the, the year before and 30 a couple of years later, right? Yeah, you know, and, and I think the biggest thing there is Bull mentally was, I'm not saying he checked out, but he was a little upset because he wanted to play every day. Yeah. And, you know, Dallas, Dallas, he would go with a hot hand. Lonnie Smith happened to be playing pretty good for us. So they were switching off and, and Bull wasn't too happy about that which I like because Bull's a competitor and he wanted right. to be in there every day. And those power hitters, they got to play, you know, they, they have those peaks and valleys, but I remember Bull not being too happy, but he still, he contributed big time going down the stretch with playoff uh, wins and everything like that. But that, I think that was one of the big reasons that his home run total was down. He wasn't in there every single day. Yeah, no doubt about it. He wasn't playing all the time. But uh, right. as I noted when I was going through this, uh, he hits that one in, in this particular game. It's number 19. That's it. But in the postseason, he had a couple really big ones for you guys. In fact, he got you guys got started off on the right foot with a Greg Lazinski home run in the postseason. So yeah. uh, when it mattered, Bull was there. Yeah, we, we knew Bull was come through. I mean, him and Schmitty, basically the three, four hitters in our lineup were outstanding. Uh, the whole time I played there, uh, both those guys, I mean, my job, when I hit at the top of the order, you know, towards the end, I start hitting at the seventh or eighth position, but when you hit at the top, you try to get on for the big boys, you know, yeah. and, uh, and they did their job. And there's no question about that. All right. Well, meanwhile, Bob Walk would just pitch uh, into the eighth, dominating the Dodgers lineup, but in the bottom of the eighth, Davey Lopes led off with a single and Dallas had decided, all right, I'm going to go to Warren Brewstar, who had been terrific out of the bullpen for you guys. He would get Jay Johnstone to fly out the center, but then Dusty Baker hits a two-run home run and makes it 3-2. And all of a sudden, you know, a team like you guys that was used to coming back and having big wins late in the – all of a sudden you got the Dodgers making a comeback. And Dusty Baker, another guy that uh, we, we don't talk about enough as a player, we, you know, uh, what a great player he was for the Dodgers. I'm telling you, Murph, uh, Baker big with men on base, man. Every time you get a guy in scoring position, he would come through. Not only was he a good clutch hitter, his average, he always hit close to 300. But I looked at their lineup, and Baker, Garvey, Say, and Mundy, that's a big-time middle of the order. And to do what Bob Walk did, and Bruce Starr, very seldom with that hard sinker, gave up any home runs. He left one up there to Baker, and Dusty did what you're supposed to do. But uh, that was a tough team to play. Uh, especially, especially in LA. Yeah.
we had Warren Brewster on uh, the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he was, you know, regaling some of the, the great moments of 1980, you know, in, from his mind. And it was just great to hear him talk about it and how exciting it was, you know, for those guys in the bullpen. And, and you know, they all knew their roles, but uh, they all wanted the ball. They all wanted to pitch. They were they were nasty. They had an attitude. <laughs> oh, we did. You know, and, yeah. and the two guys that are that are really unsung in my I mean, we know McGraw was did a tremendous right. job. But Bruce Starr and and Reed, and mm-hmm. you can even throw Dickie Knowles Dickie, in there. Yeah. Those guys did a tremendous job. And Dallas, the thing about Dallas, if somebody got called up, you would not just sit on the bench. He would use everybody. And his favorite line was, if I have relievers down there that I'm afraid to use, they shouldn't be here. <laughs> and if you go look at all the box scores in 80, he used everybody. He played everybody. And I think that basically put us over the hump in 1980 but it was a dog fight we were running out of games and we knew we had to to catch montreal and it was it was a tough road to hoe but uh as we all know, everything turned out okay. But this game in particular was a big win for us. It really was. So bottom of the night, Tug McGraw comes in to close it out. He gets the first two batters on ground outs. He lets uh, allows a base hit to Davey Lopes, but then he gets Manny Moda to ground out to short. Game over. The Phillies win it 3-2. They get you at 3-2. You gain another game in the division at that time. But the team finished the day winning their fourth in a row and now one game ahead of the Pirates in Montreal. Two hours and 19 minutes to play this game. Two hours and 19 minutes, 41,000 enjoying that. How about that? Uh, that's, um, you know, I look at some of these uh, box scores when, before we go on the air and everything. There's very seldom three hours, three and a half hours, 345, unless it's a 16 or 17 yeah, inning game. exactly. You know, you yeah. got the box, you hit, uh, and obviously the TV commercials had something to do with it. Pitchers, for the most part, they had a game plan. They executed it. There was no, there was none of this indecisiveness. Uh, as far as man on second base, they always had different signs. They didn't need the cards and everything, but the game seemed to be a, a, a much better flow back then than it is right now. Yeah, I, I think there's truth. Get the ball. And they, and they threw strikes. You know, they yeah, threw they a did. lot more strikes yes, they uh, did. back then. They certainly did. All right. Well, we know this one turned into a win, your fourth straight. However, the team would then go on to lose the next three versus the Dodgers. And when you headed back to Philadelphia, you were a half game back. In the NLE. So once again, it flip-flopped. And I would imagine as you landed in Philadelphia with a big series ahead with the Pirates, that was next on the on the board, big series with the Pirates. Uh, you probably were, you know, if, if sports radio existed back then, you'd have been hearing it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, well, we've read about it a lot. Yeah. But, you know, the bottom line on that, Murph, I mean, we, we, is, is the glass half empty or half, or half full? And I remember on the plane, we went, you know what? We went four and three on this road trip, which anytime you go out West, but the, the half, uh, half empty is we lost three straight to the Dodgers games. At least one of those games I thought we should have won, but we still felt all right about ourselves. We knew we had an uphill climb. Montreal was playing good and we know the pirates were always tough against us. All right. Well, when next we talk to you, we will revisit one of those pirates games because it might be a game that, turned everything around and uh, led you to that terrific September. So that will be uh, coming up uh, on a later podcast. But for now, Larry Ball, thanks for being with us. Always good to talk to you. All right, Murph. Take care. Glove Stories with Murph is brought to you by Red Robin. Whether you're hungry for a juicy gourmet burger with bottomless steak fries and an ice cold beer or a crispy chicken tender salad and freckled lemonade, whatever you crave, there's something for everyone at Red Robin. So dine in or order curbside to go delivery or catering. Order online now at order.redrobinpa.com. Glove Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app. New users download an app store or click parkscasino.com slash PA and use the promo code MONEY for first bet risk-free up to $500. Must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Glove Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app and Red Robin and is a production of SBC Media Partners. The engineer for Glove Stories is Chad Evans. Cindy Webster is our marketing and guest relations director, and our executive producer is Roger Haddon. Whether you are watching us on YouTube or downloading the podcast from one of our major podcast providers like Apple, Google, or Spotify, make sure to hit like and subscribe so that we can let you know when a new episode of Glove Stories is available. We'll release new episodes weekly throughout the 2021 Major League Baseball season.